Hey guys, welcome back to Fix It Friday. So this week I've got something really cool and rare and special to show you and uh, to talk about. So what you have uh, here is the Sega Dreamcast Divers 2000 CX-1 television. <laughs> so I'm sure most of you guys have never heard of this. In fact, I had never heard about this this console until um, I was reached out to by my friend JJ who, um, who had acquired it and he wanted my help getting it working. Um, so, so yeah, I'll tell you guys a little bit about it, and then hopefully we can get this thing running again. Um, so the Divers 2000 was a TV set that, um, it's a 14-inch TV, and it was made in a partnership between three companies with Sega, uh, Fuji, and, um, and CSK. And, um, basically it's a television with a Dreamcast built into it on the top, and it also comes with a couple of other peripherals, including a keyboard, and a webcam and a custom Divers 2000 Dreamcast controller. So these uh, did not sell very well in Japan. I think they cost maybe four times the price of a standard Sega Dreamcast. So <clears throat> I think at most maybe 5,000 of these were, were ever made. So they are really, really rare. They're very hard to find. So uh, what we're going to be doing today is taking apart the Divers 2000 and we're going to look at... Um, we're going to look at the laser in particular because this one does not really read games. Like every now and then it will uh, detect a game in the drive and, and it'll play it. But most of the time it does not. It'll, um, it'll just uh, say that there's no disc uh, inserted. We're also going to see if we can also change out the BIOS and install a region-free BIOS. And the reason why um, we want to do that is because it makes it way easier to play all sorts of games. Um, so JJ in particular wants to be able to use this to play American games, and uh, of course it doesn't do that. It's a Japanese Dreamcast, so it only plays Japanese games. Uh, so by switching out the BIOS with a region-free BIOS, um, that'll let us play pretty much any game that we want. Um, however, I really have no idea if that's even possible, because as you might imagine, there is absolutely no information on this TV whatsoever. So, um, you know, your guess is as good as mine about whether any of these things are going to be possible. So yeah, so today we're going to take this thing apart, we're going to see if we can get it running again, and then if we can, we'll install a region-free BIOS. So let's get started. Okay, so I started doing a little bit of disassembly, and I just want to share my progress so far. Um, so the Divers TV, uh, in some ways, is similar to any other CRT, where you try to find a whole bunch of screws on the exterior, and you try to pull those all out. So I've done that already. So there's six over here. There's two on the side, and then way up over here, right underneath the um, this platform that holds everything, are two screws as well. And most of them are all the same. They're all this this kind of size. Uh, the only exception are are these two these two black screws right here, and these come from the side of of the television. So once that's done, you can actually pull these side panels off. There's like actually a little handle that allows you to to do this. Um, I've already managed to do that here on, on this side, and um, I'm going to just zoom in really quick, and you can actually see that it looks to me like there is literally a Dreamcast just sitting inside of here. I was not expecting that. I mean, it's, it's not only a Dreamcast, it's a Dreamcast with a shell and everything. So I, I didn't count on that at all. <laughs> I was really expecting that I would find... Um, Something like what I've found in the Sharp Nintendo television or in the um, Super Famicom TV where, where you have this custom-made board um, that, that runs everything. But what it really appears to be here is an actual Dreamcast that literally just is mounted into the shell. And, and that is crazy. I did not expect that. So, um, so yeah, I'm going to keep taking things apart a little more and... Uh, and this, just go step by step and show you guys everything that I've done. But yeah, so far, just to summarize, the first thing is to take off the screws, and then the second thing is to pull these panels apart, and you can use these like little lids that are on the side in order to do so. Alright, so I've made just a little bit more progress. Um, so what I wanted to do first was get these side panels off, and they have two little connectors on each side. Thankfully, um, they're different from each other. One has three pins and one has two pins. So that's great. It makes it impossible to um, mix up these wires uh, from each other. So that was simple. It's just a matter of pulling them out. And then from there, I found that there were three more Phillips screws that on each side that attach this back half of the, of the chassis to the front half. 
Thankfully, just like everywhere else, it's the same types of screws, um, so you don't have to really worry about keeping them separate from each other. So now that I've done that, I mean, you can technically move the... Um, uh, yeah, so now you can technically lift the, the whole chassis up. Um, I'm not going to do that quite yet because I haven't figured out, you know, there's a lot of wires that have everything connected to each other. Um, so I'm going to go ahead first and make sure I can disconnect things safely before I go ahead and, and do so. Okay, so <clears throat> what I've found after removing these chassis screws is that this whole back portion here can be can be moved and it holds the analog board for the television and it's kind of good to kind of separate <clears throat> separate out the shell and space it out because you really don't have a lot of room to take the Dreamcast off. The Dreamcast is just sitting here. It looks like there are four screws that hold it into place. And just like before, they're the same kinds of screws that hold together the rest of the, sh uh, the shell. The, the thing is, is that it is extremely close to the neck board. So you really got to be careful when you're taking this off, because if you crack this neck board, then you will destroy this TV, and that is the end of this console. Like, you really got to be very, very careful here. Um, <clears throat> so, so for now, what I've done is I've just separated this out. I've already removed the two lower screws that hold the Dreamcast into place. So now I'm going to try to get rid of these two top screws and hopefully that's enough so that I can take the Dreamcast out. Um, just one other thing to note, I found that basically it has extension cables. So for example, this is the modem extension cable. So that fits right into here and it just plugs in. So the modem just comes from here to a little port on the back of the television. The same is true for the AV port and for the serial port and the power. So all of that is just little extenders that go out from the Dreamcast to different places on the analog board or to this multi-out jack over here. So, so yeah, I'm going to try to get the last two screws out, um, and I hope that's enough so that I can get the Dreamcast unit free. And I probably will not touch the rest of the television because the television is working just fine. I don't need to actually do any repairs to that. All right, so I think I might have figured out why I can't remove the top half of the shell. And it looks like there are these two plastic locks. There's one on this side. And then there's one on the opposite side. So I think what I need to do is just pry those open. I'm going to use like a spudger tool to, to hold those open and see if I can get that unlocked. And I think once that is done, then I can lift this whole top half off with the entire Dreamcast with it. And that was better than what I was thinking before, where I had to actually unscrew the Dreamcast. Because, um, uh, yeah, the, the lid is still attached to the top, so that's definitely not going to work. I think what I really need to do is just disconnect those clamps and then I can set the whole top half free and then from there I can easily work on the Dreamcast. Oof, all right. Got it. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow, that was tough. Okay, so... So yeah, my hypothesis was correct. So you've got these two little clamps that hold it in place. And I basically just used some some spudger tools and, and basically opened up one side and then held it down with the spudger and then came over on the other side and clipped it off. And so now, yeah, you can very easily see the entire television. Um, and so you can see that, you know, there are basically controller port extensions that are plugged into each port of the Dreamcast. And then those go all the way down to the bottom, and that's where the ports are on the television. Um, and then, yeah, I was I was trying to demonstrate this earlier when I was taking apart the TV. But you know, you've got your you've got your serial connections and your AV connection and your power and your modem all plugged in, and those go directly into the board. All right, so so now this thing has been better taken apart. So I'm going to go ahead and start um, disassembling the Dreamcast and taking a look at it. All right, so the Dreamcast has finally been removed from the TV, and uh, I have it here. We're going to look at it on the bench in more detail. 
Um, but yeah, I just wanted to show you that it was hanging upside down like this, and it basically has four long screws that, that hold it into place. And this is very similar to how a normal Dreamcast is when you're trying to take the lid off uh, the top half from the bottom half. So really, it's very, very similar. Um, you can also see the control ports right over here. And uh, I'm actually going to zoom in and show you this, so this is kind of cool. So all of these are actually labeled from the factory uh, with numbers. And this is because you can't tell which port is port 1, 2, 3, or 4 from over here. Um, so when you're assembling this, uh, they were labeled in permanent ink by somebody at the factory so that you could put them in correctly. So I think that's kind of cool. Um, an interesting thing you would not know unless you took apart this television. All right, so we're going to go ahead and take the Dreamcast, put it on the bench. Uh, we're going to test it out, see if we can get a good working drive on there, and then uh, move on to see if we can do a region BIOS on here. Okay, back in a sec. All right, so I've got the Divers 2000 Dreamcast plugged into my test monitor here. And you can see that in every respect, it is a completely stock uh, Dreamcast. There is nothing unique about it in that respect. Um, maybe the power supply is a little bit different. Like, there's, it seems to be a little bit larger than the one that I'm used to seeing. But then again, this is a Japanese Dreamcast. I haven't really worked with any of those before, so that could be a difference just in region. So this could just be a Japanese Dreamcast with a slightly different power supply. I'm not sure. Maybe somebody in the comments can confirm that for me when they take a look. Um, but yeah, you can see that everything loads. Um, one thing I will show you though is that this disk drive is marginal. So sometimes it will detect a game like Gunbird 2 here. Other times it'll spin up, but it won't actually pick up the game. So I'm pretty sure that this laser is just bad uh, or is failing. So I'm just going to try again. Yeah, so you see it spins up a little bit and then it goes right back down to, to nothing. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and switch this out with a confirmed working laser because I do have one of those on hand um, and I think that's probably the easiest way to solve this uh, rather than to try to you know, re repair this specific laser. There's nothing special or um, unique about a Japanese Dreamcast laser versus an American one. Um, the region differences lie at the BIOS level. So, so yeah, let's go ahead and switch that out and see if that makes a difference. All right, so I have replaced the laser with one from an American console, and I didn't do really all that much. It's just three screws to remove it and to put in the laser, and this is the uh, original one from the divers, and I just wanted to kind of show you that if you if you flip open the lid over here, you can see that there's like a worm screw and some gears, and so what I did with this one, I mean, it's a totally working laser, but just as uh, a bit of maintenance, I took some, uh, some lubricant, and I'll put a link in the description for which type this is, um, and I just used it on the worm screw and on the gears, and that's just to make sure that everything continues to move smoothly and freely and doesn't get, like, gummed up on friction. Um, that kind of thing can make seek times longer on, on disk drives and just take it, you know, a little bit more time and effort to, uh, to load. So, so yeah, I'm going to power this Dreamcast up, and I'm going to hold this switch down. This is the switch that tells the Dreamcast that the lid is closed. And when I power it on, you'll see that it's going to run through the motions and play this game. Okay, so yeah, you can see that Gunbird 2 is loading just fine, and uh, so yeah, that part of the uh, Divers 2000 Dreamcast is fixed. So now I'm going to go ahead and take it apart further and see if we can do a region-free BIOS mod to this console. All right, guys, I'm sorry, but I have a brief interruption in my plans for this video. <laughs> so I did ultimately try to install that region-free BIOS, and unfortunately, I had a bad chip. So uh, it was not flashed correctly, and so I didn't. I was unable to get it to work. Um, I tried that on the divers, and I also tried it on a standard motherboard, and I got the exact same result. So I know that the chip itself was bad. Uh, in the end, what I did was I took the original Sega BIOS and reinstalled it in both this motherboard and in the other one that I was testing, and I got both of those consoles to go back to normal. So I know I've got a bad 
uh, custom BIOS. So I just need to get somebody to help me out and flash that chip, and at some point I will install it into this television. I'm sorry, into this, <laughs> into this Dreamcast. So for now, what I did was I just rebuilt the system with the working disk drive, and I wanted to just provide a brief demonstration of how this unique console works. So, um, as you can see, there's four buttons up here for controlling the television. You've also got your four Dreamcast ports down here. And then over here, you've got a little window for your uh, IR for the remote control. Um, so unfortunately, I do not have the remote control, but I can still control all the important stuff using these buttons. First thing I want to do is just tell you that these buttons are honestly kind of strange. So you can't turn them on by just pushing straight. You actually have to kind of push them at an angle from the top or from the bottom. And so this guy over here is just power on or power off for the TV. This guy over here cycles through modes, and you have three modes. You have uh, RF, you've got um, composite video, and then you've got CX1, which is the built-in Dreamcast. Um, over here, this does volume control, so you can just toggle up or, or down. And again, that's kind of backwards, so pushing down gives you an increase in volume and vice versa. It's so strange. And then over here, this changes your channels when you're in RF mode. On the back of the TV, there are ports for composite video and RF. Uh, there's also a modem port, so you can access the internal modem on the Dreamcast. And then there's also some MIDI ports, and those actually connect up to the serial port on the Dreamcast, so that must be in use with some kind of peripheral for the uh, Dreamcast that I'm not aware of. Maybe maybe for the, for the keyboard? Really not sure, but that's what's on the back. So, um... So now, let me just show you a little bit more about this TV, which is kind of cool. So, if you look up here, this is where the, um, the disk drive is. So you just push right here, it pops open, you pop in your game, and that's it. So, you know, I don't, I'm not going to show that right now. That's nothing special, though. It's just like a standard Dreamcast, really. So, um, I'm going to kind of come over to the side right here and give you a little side profile of the TV. And the first thing I want to do is just show you the Divers 2000 um, controller. So it has its own special controller. Um, I really love the look. This clear green is perfect because this is also a clear green plastic, so so the effect is, is awesome. Um, this system would have come with more stuff. So it would have come with a remote control, it would have come with a webcam, a keyboard, probably some other stuff too. So it... it it's a really crazy setup, and you got a lot with um, your purchase. So yes, it was four times more expensive than a Dreamcast, but you did get a decent amount of stuff with it, so that's kind of cool. Um, so some of you might have noticed here that on the side, there is actually an array of LEDs. So when you go into Dreamcast mode and you play a game, what happens is that these LEDs are going to light up in response to the music. And also, because this is stereo sound, and you have a speaker here and on the other side, the lights will activate differently. So whatever's coming out of left channel audio is going to light up differently than what's coming off on right channel audio. So I'm going to hit start, and then we're going to see Gunbird 2, and then you can see the pattern of lights uh, in response to the music. Really cool, right? <laughs> and I, I really think that, you know, the aesthetic of this television, the clear plastic, you know, the, the transparent looking power cord, the whole thing, it just feels so late 90s, early 2000s, and I just love that aesthetic. It makes me think of IMAX and all that kind of stuff. Um, I love the fact that it has these LEDs that come on in response to the music. Um, it's just really cool. It's a really special console. And I feel really privileged to have uh, gotten this thing working again. So the great news about this particular unit is that all of you guys have the chance to see it for yourself in real life and play on it. So this Divers 2000 is going to be available for the public to enjoy at the next Long Island Retro Gaming Expo. Hopefully that will be in August of 2021. And if not, then it'll definitely be at the next expo after that and you guys will get to see it for yourselves. All right, so if you guys like this content, it would be great if uh, you can give me a like or perhaps subscribe to the channel. I have videos like this that come out every Friday, and uh, let me know what you guys think in the comments below. I'd really love to hear your feedback. Okay, so thanks so much, guys, for watching. I will see you next time.